Good morning. I'm Dr. David Bixler, and I am the physics director for the Science UIL contest. In other words, I'm the guy who writes all of those questions for the physics part of the science contest. Since we can't have our student activities conferences this fall, we're doing a number of videos, a couple on biology, a couple on chemistry, and three on physics to help students, coaches, and anyone involved in the Science UIL contest to be a little better prepared when we are able to actually hold the contests. Now, I wanna direct this first video to the students. Primarily, I'm talking to students who maybe are new to UIL altogether or haven't been around at least terribly long. Maybe this is your second year. Last year was not quite the way we would like it to be. So I'd like to give you a little information about the physics questions, and then we'll look at a few physics questions, take a look in detail at how you might approach some of them. It doesn't escape my attention that physics is often the most skipped section. And I understand that physics being the third science that most people take, many of you have not even had a physics course, or you're just now in your first one, when you take these contests. So I understand that there's a lot of times many things that you might not know that later down the line you will know and you'll be able to answer questions. I just want to give you a little bit of strategy so that you can start early on making some progress in this particular topic. So let's start by taking a look at the directed reading. So every science contest, every set of physics questions begins with three questions from a directed reading. Now, the reason for this is because many of you have not yet had a physics course. But if you can read a book, you can answer these questions. The book this year is Seven Brief Lessons on Physics by Carlo Rovelli. Can see a picture of it there. This particular book is actually very short. Chapters are not very long. They are dense. They have a lot of information in them, but it's not a truly challenging read in terms of material. So it should be something that everyone can do. Now, I don't even ask you to read the whole thing, at least not to start with. It has seven chapters in it because it is seven brief lessons on physics. But for the first invitational, you only need to read the first two chapters. And for invitational B, we only add one more. Now, a little warning here. If you read chapters one and two for invitational A, it's going to be a while before you take the test for invitational B you might want to go back and review those first two chapters and then read the third one. And the reason for this is sometimes there's some details that I ask about that you'll forget if you haven't looked at the book in a while. So skimming back through, and you don't have to sit there and read every word, but skimming back through just to remind yourself of what was in those first couple of chapters is probably a good idea. We get the district, we're moved up to chapters three and four. Most of you, I hope, are able to compete at the district level. And then a select group of you will make it to the regional contest. And now you've got chapters four, five, and six. You actually move the rest of the way through the book. And for that small group that makes it to state, you will add on chapter seven, that very last chapter. So, this breakdown kind of gives you an idea of what you need to know from the book. And it does not matter if you have had a physics course or not. It doesn't matter your knowledge level of physics. If you can read a book, you can answer these questions. And three questions can give you 18 points if you get all three of them right. So this is something that was put in to help kind of ease everyone into the physics section of the contest and hopefully we'll get you a good start for making a good score on that section. Of course, we would like to have um, higher scores than that eventually. So we want you to be able to move into some of the other topics. 
The other questions are going to divide into three groups, conceptual, symbolic, and numeric. Most everything is numerical. I would say 80% of my questions have numbers in them. So you're going to need a calculator. You're going to be punching numbers into your calculator and giving answers as numerical answers. There are a few conceptual questions. The astronomy question is generally conceptual. Um, things in modern physics, quantum physics, those are often conceptual. Symbolic questions are basically math questions where I don't give you numbers, you're just doing algebra. And I save those for regional and state tests primarily. I'm not going to have a lot of symbolic type questions early in the contests because they are typically more challenging. The difficulty level does range a lot. Um, some of the questions, even on invitational A and B, could be challenging, depending on the topic. We'll talk about the topics in a moment. But I always try to throw in a few that aren't unapproachable, some easier questions. Even on the state test, there will be one or two that are not tremendously difficult. So identifying that is one of your key points. Being able to look at a question and say, this one's a hard question. It's going to take me a while, or this is an easy question. And that does come with practice. The more physics questions you work through, the better of a sense you'll have of the range of difficulty. Um, advanced math notations, things like calculus, vector notation, a lot of that stuff really pretty much reserved for the state contest. So don't worry about your math level. You're mostly going to just need trigonometry, geometry, and algebra. So if you've had algebra one and if you've had geometry at least up through sine, cosine, and tangent functions, then you're, you're going to be fine as far as your math goes for most of the questions. But you need to know your formulas. Physics comes with a huge pile of formulas. Now, thankfully, they can be divided up. There's formulas for uniformly accelerated motion. There's formulas for forces. There's formulas for energy. And each topic only has a few. So if you can divide it up, organize it in your mind, it's a lot easier. I know early on, if you're just getting started in this contest, you're not going to know them all. You're not going to know every physics formula. So pick on the ones you know you can learn quickly and focus on those types of questions. When you're working through the contest, make sure you pay attention to units. Um, a lot of times information is given to you in centimeters or millimeters or capacitance in microfarads or resistance in kilo ohms or something like that. Pay attention to those. One of the questions, question number five, often is about converting units, converting inches per hour into millimeters per minute or something like that. So pay attention to units. Pay attention to pictures. Some pictures are given, some are not, but if you feel like you need to make a diagram, make one, make it big. Draw lots of things on it, label lots of things on it. Pictures always help visualize. Physics questions help a lot if you can visualize them. You can really get through a lot of them. So make the diagrams. Order of magnitude answers, not going to show up a huge amount, but every so often you will see answers where your four or five answer choices are all different orders of magnitude. 10 to the 4th, 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 7th kinds of magnitudes. And you often don't need to worry about doing the math exactly in order to estimate the order of magnitude. So sometimes you can just figure it out. You know, if we're talking about a baseball game and somebody hits a baseball and one of the choices is 2 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, you should know that's not going to be right. Nobody's going to hit a baseball at two-thirds the speed of light. So sometimes order of magnitude will help you. Working backwards, really useful. A lot of times these problems, if you work them forward, require a significant amount of algebra. But you can set up the initial equation, the initial formula, and just plug in the answers to it. Narrow it down to two or three answer choices. Just plug those back in, and sometimes you'll find which one works very, very quickly. 
I already mentioned about problem identification, figuring out which ones are easier, and knowing which ones to skip to help speed you up and know when to come back later or maybe when to, to totally skip one of them. Okay, so we want to go back to the questions themselves. A few years ago, I started dividing up the questions where each topic goes with a particular question number. And that has done a lot of good for helping all of you to know which questions to tackle and maybe which ones to skip. The first three, always from the book, always from that directed reading. So when you get to the physics section, P1, P2, P3, if all you know about physics is what you've read in that book, you can still get those three questions. And you don't have to worry about anything else. Although P4 is often approachable. It's an astronomy question. It tends to be a concrete knowledge question. It's just something you know, often something you've picked up from either other reading you've done or even just from watching TV. If you've watched educational television, you know, something like The Elegant Universe or Cosmos, something like that, you're going to know a lot of those answers for question four. If you read it and you don't know it, that's fine, but the more you learn about physics, the more you learn about astronomy, you'll start to find that that question four is pretty easy. Question five, many of you that have just had biology or chemistry can actually approach because this is often a question about changing units or significant figures or just simple order of magnitude answers. These are things done in every science. And so you will get this in biology, you will get this in chemistry, you probably got this in middle school. And so it's something P5 is worth looking at at all times. After that, we move into physics one, kind of the stuff that you would do in a first physics course, acceleration, forces, energy, circular motion. And um, that kind of follows how most books will go through the semester. The last physics one topic is usually fluids and thermodynamics, and that's question 11 for us. In question 12, we move into two. Now, physics two is electricity, magnetism, electric fields, magnetic fields, and also optics. And so you'll see those same topics kind of run through here. Many, many students don't see these till later spring semester of their first physics course or even in their second physics course. So many of these topics might be a little bit harder or might be a little bit unfamiliar to you. And that's okay. Questions 17 and 18 get into modern physics, nuclear physics, quantum and particle physics. Again, if you've watched some educational television, you might have heard of some of these things. You might even know some of the answers. These tend to be conceptual questions. So sometimes they're a little bit easier because they don't have math involved. If you've done some extra reading, other books, those would also be perhaps easier. Trying on your high school physics class, these typically come at the end of physics courses. They're not something that you're going to cover early on. So they're not going to be things you would see, have seen in your classes, but they're often things that are very flashy and make their way into the popular literature. So you may know a little something about them anyway. Questions 19 and 20 are experimental physics questions. These are based on laboratory results, based on actual data. Uh, number 19 is from a physics one topic, a mechanics type topic or a thermo type topic. And question 20 is from physics two. So something in electricity and magnetism, something in optics, or something in nuclear physics. We'll take a look at some of those in a moment. So that gives you the layout. Now you know kind of how things are structured. Let's switch over and take a look at some actual questions. Now this is, in fact, a standard uniformly accelerated motion question. Soccer ball gets kicked. You've got a velocity. You've got an angle. Anytime you see an angle, you know you're probably going to be doing sines and cosines. That's typically what's done with those. And 
this one probably would benefit from having a picture. So I'm going to go ahead and show you a quick approach here. And we will draw a picture first. So we have a soccer ball. And we have a goal structure over here. And the soccer ball goes up and hits the top of the goal. It's the crossbar. So we know a little bit of, about how the soccer ball started. We have 13 meters per second. We have an angle of 24 degrees to start with. And that allows us to then figure out very important things like our initial velocity in the x direction, which would be 13 meters per second times the cosine of 24 degrees, the degrees outside of there, whatever, and the y direction is the sine of 24 degrees. So these are the kind of things you would start off with when you are approaching these types of problems. Um, we know a little bit of other information. We know this distance is 9.50 meters. So whenever you look at this problem, first thing you want to do is probably draw a picture. And as you start drawing the picture, you can start to piece together what you're looking for, how high above the ground. So that's this H. Basically find H. And then what information you're given. Things like how far over the 9.5 meters or velocities like 13 meters per second. Now, what formulas would you be using for this? Well, uniformly accelerated motion comes with really three formulas. You have V final equals V initial acceleration times time. So that's a, a good formula. And then we have our position information, x final is x initial plus velocity times time plus one half at squared. And you have the same formula with just y's on everything as well. And then you have this formula, which relates, and that's AX, which relates the um, final velocity to a position or a distance. Now, knowing the formulas doesn't tell you how to solve the problem, but if you don't know the formulas, you're not going to necessarily be able to solve this problem. I can tell you that um, probably the easiest formula to start with is actually that third one right there. And that's because both of these other two formulas involve the variable time. And that's one thing completely missing from this question. There is no time given in this question. Nowhere in here does it mention time. So that is kind of an approach to one question. Now, that's only one type of question. There are others and decisions you have to make when you reach these others. This question right here could fall into a diff couple of different categories. You have a brick, you push it up against a spring, it compresses the spring, and then the sort of spring-loaded brick gets flung across the floor. It slides and eventually stops thanks to friction. Now, just seeing it like this, you might not know how to approach it. Do you treat this as an acceleration problem? Because the brick does get accelerated. Do you treat it as a force problem? Because there's forces from the spring and from friction. But knowing that this particular problem happens to be number eight, this is a P8 type problem, that tells you but this is a problem dealing with energy. 
So knowing the topic going with that number actually helps narrow down how to approach these problems. Once you know its energy, guess what? There's only a handful of things, handful of formulas. Energy, you've only got a few formulas. Plastic potential, which is our spring. You have kinetic, which isn't probably going to be involved in this particular question. You have gravitational potential, which also is not going to be involved, by the way, because this wonderful brick is on the floor the whole time. And then you have work, which is a force times the distance. Now that one's going to be useful because that's where our friction is going to come in. So in terms of what you would be using here, you know, you're going to be using this formula because you're going to need that to deal with the friction. And of course, you're going to need that formula to deal with the initial energy in the spring. So those are the two kind of two formulas you would need. Um, one of the videos later that I make, the third video, we will actually go through and solve these problems completely. But here, I'm just helping you get set up. So what about this kind of a problem? Well, this is a thermodynamics problem. We have an ideal gas. We have a volume associated with it. But notice the units on that volume. The units here, oh, that's liters. That is not the best unit to be in. So when I said watch units, this is the place where it comes in. Now you are given the temperature in Kelvin, which is nice. I was being nice. I didn't give it a Celsius. But the liters problem, well, that's going to show up. That actually means... times 10 to the minus 3 cubic meters. So this would actually turn into 25 times 10 to the negative 3 cubic meters. Now, in many cases, you don't need to convert to cubic meters. But knowing that conversion will probably help you, especially in problems where the answers come out in joules which is exactly what happens here. Notice our units on our answers are in joules. In order to joules, you need newtons times meters. I can't be in liters to start. I've got to convert over to these cubic meters. So paying attention to things like that, that's a unit issue. Other than that, this problem's pretty easy. Of course, you've got equations you know from chemistry. We have the ideal gas law. Of course we can use that. Also reading the question, how much work was done by the gas? Okay, work is going to be W during this isobaric. Oh, vocabulary. Vocabulary is very important. Isobaric means constant pressure. You can kind of see the pieces there. Iso means constant. Eric means pressure. So this is going to be a constant pressure situation. And the work for a constant pressure situation is P times V final minus V initial. So that gives you the formula. There's a different work formula for isothermal. There's a different work formula for adiabatic. So knowing your vocabulary, very, very, very important, just like knowing your formulas. Now, this is actually a um, chemistry word here, this, because this is actually almost more of a chemistry problem. But we use these same concepts in physics when we're talking about engines and thermodynamics. So we get to use some of these types of problems as well. Now let's take a look at some Physics 2 type questions. Physics 2 is often something that 
is later in a person's high school career. So many of you may not have seen this yet, even if you've had a physics class. But optics is one of the easiest of all of the topics in physics too. I think optics is probably the easiest one. First off, we have good experience with it. If you've looked through a lens, a magnifier at any point in your life, if you wear glasses or contacts, you already have experience with optics. So this is not something that's foreign to you. It's not something that's unknown. And there's also only two formulas. So in this particular case, we have that formula and we have that formula. The first one is how we figure out where an image shows up. So basically what you have is you have an object distance and you have an image distance. And we can figure out what that image distance is based on knowing the focal length. So you typically are going to want to know the focal length or that may be what you're looking for if you know both of the distances. And then down here we have our magnification formula, which will tell you how much something has been magnified by. The minus sign on this just tells you whether the resulting image is upside down or not. If the magnification turns out to be negative, then it means the image is upside down. If the magnification is positive, then it means the image is right side up. So. That's all that minus sign really does. If we look at this formula or in this question, we have a converging lens. That means a positive focal length. So we know the focal length is positive. And we even know what it is, eight centimeters. So there's F. And held at a distance of three centimeters from the ant. That gives you P. So now just use this formula right here. You just use this formula and you can get Q. And once you get Q, you already know P, it's up there. You can go over to this formula for magnification and it will tell you what the magnification is. Again, we don't really care much about the negative sign or the positive sign, what, whether magnification is positive or negative, unless we were specifically asked, is it upside down? Is it right side up? Um, this particular one's going to come out to be right side up. So that's awesome because it's a magnifier and you know you don't usually see things up close with the magnifier upside down. So that gives you a little bit of an idea of a physics two question. This, by the way, is P16. So that's a question further down the line that you can certainly approach, certainly would know how to deal with. Now, I want to take a look at a couple of the experimental physics questions just to give you kind of this last little bit of information about how these look. In some cases, I will give you a graph. This particular one being an example of that, we have uh, a basic circuit, we have a resistor and some kind of a, a power supply. We run different amounts of current through this resistor and acquire different voltages across the resistor. And we plot them, we get a straight line. The reason you get a straight line is because the, the law that this is describing is Ohm's law. So basically this is relating directly to Ohm's law, which is V equals IR. This being your voltage and your current being I. Now notice milliamps. So we're going to, that's going to end up with 
a factor of 10 to the minus 3 involved in it. So just pay attention to that kind of thing too. There's that units coming back. And you're just solving for R here. The fact that the law is pretty straightforward and the resulting graph is linear, it's a straight line, makes this a fairly easy problem. I will give you one hint. If it's a straight line like this, you usually want to find the slope. Nine times out of 10, if I give you a straight line, anything in physics, if it turns out to be a straight line, the slope is important. Occasionally the intercept is important, but you can see the intercept actually is zero, so that's convenient. But the slope, virtually always important. I can't think of a situation where it's not. So pay attention. If you see a straight line, find a slope. It's always going to going to help you somehow in solving these problems. And then if you know the law again, knowing which physical law, which formula we're talking about really helps you see exactly how this lays out. In fact, you can tell from that law that whatever slope we find, it's equal to one over the resistance. So once you find the slope, just invert it, and then that'll give you your answer. So that's one type of these experimental physics questions. The other type looks something like this, where you might have a tabulated set of data given to you. This is one from Physics 1. It's actually a density question. You find the weight of, an, of a mineral. I guess this is, yes, this is a mineral. We find the weight in air, and then we find the weight in water. So when you submerge it in water, you get the buoyant force involved, and of course that causes it to feel a little bit lighter, so the weight goes down. Mass is still the same. Keep that in mind. But the weight does, does change. There's four sets of data here. Now, when you're given a tabulated set of data, in many cases, you only need one set of data. I could literally just take A and just use those two numbers and figure out the answer. I don't need the rest of the data there. Occasionally, You'll see situations where you might need to subtract pairs, so you actually need two sets of data. Um, but in most cases, you don't even need to do that. Most of the time, you're going to be looking at basically one data point. Anytime I give you a graph and the graph is not a straight line, same deal. You pick one data point on that graph and you can usually answer the question. So this one. I could use A, I could use B, I could use C, I could use D, but I don't have to use them all. The reason there's lots of data here is because if you were actually doing this in an experimental lab, you would collect multiple trials. But to answer this multiple choice question, one set of data will suffice and it will give you an answer. I don't know what the answer is that it will give you, but it might give you something that is close to, but not exactly equal to one of the choices. Let's say, for example, if the choice were the 8,900 kilograms per meter cubed, you might get 8,750 or something like that. Well, then you know which one's closer. That one's closest. And that's how you want to pick it. If you did the calculation for all four of them and average to that calculation, you might get exactly 8,900. But you can do just one point and get close enough to be able to call the right answer out. So pay attention to that whenever you are faced with these kinds of questions 19 and 20. I feel like in many ways questions 19 and 20 are some of the easiest on the test, but there are also some of the ones that can easily throw people throw, you know, you can kind of get confused on them pretty easily if you don't know how to parse down all that data. So 
Just a few suggestions here on how to approach some certain physics questions, how to approach the contest itself. One thing about physics, it is the third of the three sections. You start with biology, that's first. Then you run into the chemistry component. If you're not paying attention to the clock, you can often run out of time in the physics section. So I recommend always leaving a little bit of time there. Um, if you can get through biology and chemistry in a total of an hour and a half, you have two hours for the entire exam. That still leaves you 30 minutes for physics. And that's enough time to do the book questions, an optics question, maybe a uniformly accelerated motion question, and maybe the two experimental physics questions. And so you, you've got some time to get some points. It is very rare that anyone would be comfortable answering every single physics question. And that's okay. But it also is bad if you don't answer any because the reading is 18 free points. So whenever you start this contest and you know as a freshman you're pretty far away from from taking physics but do the readings get those 18 points learn one topic at a time and i do recommend optics as an easy one to pick up it's we have a lot of familiarity with it um, and it only has two formulas and you have both of them now i can make things more complicated multiple lenses and things like that that you will see in later contests. But if you're just getting started, don't worry about those. Don't worry about the more complicated ones until you are comfortable working the simple ones. Uniformly accelerated motion, um, you can start with one dimensional problems. That's what you'll see on Invitational A and usually on Invitational B. As you get more comfortable with physics or when you take your first physics class, you'll get a lot of practice with forces, energy, Physics 2, you'll get a lot of practice with circuits. These are things that would allow you to answer even more questions. So the whole idea is to gather as many points as possible. Now, I mentioned that very few people are comfortable answering every question. There are some of you who are comfortable answering every question. I know that at state, the last time we were able to hold state, so back in 2019, there was a perfect score on physics. All 20 questions answered, all 20 questions answered correctly. So it is not only possible, but it has been done at the state level. So certainly there are some of you that are not concerned at all, but I'm primarily directing these videos to those of you who are just starting out, maybe haven't had a physics class, or maybe you're just now in one. And I want you to have confidence in learning a few formulas and approaching these problems. In the next video, I'm going to be focusing on what coaches need to know to help all of you get to where you need to get going on these physics questions. And then in the very last video, the third one, I will focus on just solving some of these problems. We'll go back, uh, may use some of the ones I talked about today, but I'll probably bring in some others and we will solve them completely out so that you can see all of the mathematics involved. It's mostly just algebra, a little bit of geometry, a little bit of trig functions, and right, right triangle trig functions, nothing too complicated. But you'll be able to see all of that math in that third video. All right, I hope that this has been helpful to some of you, and that I wish you well when you do approach these contests in the spring.